Broadcasting live from Baltimore, Maryland, the Breath of Life Ministries presents Experience the Power. When God gets ready, He can deliver you. If you call on Him, if you trust in Him, He's worthy of the praise. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, You're supposed to be down flat on your face, but the power of God will lift you up. And now let's go live to the Miracle Temple Worship Center, where our service is in progress. Uh, tonight, uh, we have a topic that's uh, interesting. I've had a couple of people ask, what does that mean? And they evidently can't find it. Well, here it is. Proverbs, the fifth chapter. Proverbs chapter five. And uh, it's, it's there. I try, to, I try to make them as clear as possible, but they're all in the Bible. They have to be. Because you really don't need to worry about what I think. It's what God says that counts. And so that's where we go. Here it is, Proverbs chapter 5. Verse 15 says, Drink waters out of thine own cistern, and running waters of thine own well. There it is. Tonight we're speaking on the topic, Drinking from your own well. Would you pray with me before we begin? Father in heaven, we are so grateful tonight for another opportunity to enjoy the Word of God, to experience the power of Jesus in the Word of God. Some people seem to think that it's drudgery to be in the Bible. They seem to want to make it drudgery. But when we open the Word, there is power, there is joy, there is salvation. And so tonight we pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit will hover over us and move among us so that we might feel the power and sense it in our minds and hearts. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let me uh, do something tonight that I've done at least once before. I have inverted my sermon. I, I sometimes want to put the uh, best for last. Uh, in the Bible, you remember about the water that Jesus changed. And when he had finished, they said, uh, where'd this come from? And somebody remarked, you saved the best for last. Well, if Jesus comes in the house, it's good at the beginning and it gets better and better. What do you say? Amen. Incidentally, a Christian marriage ought to be that way. It ought to be just like that. Jesus performed that miracle at a wedding. It's a good symbol. If you are connected in Christ, it ought to start good and get better. So let's begin with a few uh, general admonitions. Uh, most of the uh, folk in here who are married already know these things, but let's just remind you. First of all, you should do whatever you can to maintain family worship. Now in these days it's not easy because everybody's on a different schedule. But if you take the time, if you make the time to pull the family together and to worship the God of heaven, to let Jesus have a place in your life, I guarantee that it'll make a difference. You ought to plan weekly family days. Family days. Uh, not easy to maintain, but you know, you ought to sit down and look at each other at least once. Long time ago, let me tell all of you young people, ages ago, people used to eat together. <laughs> I know it's hard to believe, but they actually sat down at a table all at one time, and at that moment, they would say grace over the food, and then Sometimes they'd repeat texts, sometimes they'd share something, but it gave them a moment to come together. You ought to plan not only worship, but days when the family comes together. You ought to make family activities joyous. Uh, some houses resemble mausoleums. Huh? And if you think that's going to make you grow and be happy, in fact, uh, sometimes it worries me that people believe that in order to be holy, you should be sad. Eh? Oh, come on. Don't act like you, do. you haven't seen any of them. I've met people who looked like they were, who acted like they were baptized in lemon juice. They, they wanted to be holy, but they pretended that being sad makes you holy. If you ever read in Galatians, the, the, the chapter 5, where it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, of course, love is the fruit of the Spirit, but the first manifestation after that is joy. 
So if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, there ought to be joy. Uh, you ought to demonstrate love constantly. Now, gentlemen, this is a time when maybe we need to talk. Because I know that, you know, some of us think that if you bring home money, and if you bring food, and if you supply things, that your wife ought to know that you love her. Well, there's something about the way women are wired they like to kind of hear it, even though it may seem obvious to you. So look, it really won't, it won't crack your jaw, it won't hurt your throat, it will not make your teeth look worse. You can actually squeeze it out. Remember before you got married, all that stuff you used to talk? Huh? You had songs that everybody knew, but you put a little twist on them. Huh? You had poems that you thought she had never heard before and you pretended that they might have been yours But you always had some little sweet something to say now when you get married all you got to do mm. <laughs> Got to do better than that uh, the fact is that uh, marriage does not consist of Temporal things that's a that's a five dollar word that means it doesn't matter how much you have. I want to read a text about that one because uh, there are some people, in fact I know ladies, who are looking for a man with money. And you know who you are. <laughs> Luke chapter 12, this is in the Bible. And uh, while I'm on it, I might as well say that there are some men who are looking for women with money. If my granddaddy could have gotten a hold of you. Granddaddy had stuff to say about a man who wouldn't take care of the house, but I, I got that coming. That's, this is Luke chapter 12 and verse 15 says this, And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth, consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. Life is not made up of money. Uh, I used to read all the time about Howard Hughes, a wealthy man who died in a strange situation and proved by his life that money can't buy happiness. Money is okay. I'm not mad at money, but money ought not be the only criteria you use to make your marriage work. It, there are people who have lots of money. When I started in the ministry, I went to... Uh, to a church just for a while and and uh, they assigned me a couple that needed counsel I I felt very out of place I hadn't been married that long myself and when these people came in I discovered that they were very wealthy in fact when I asked the lady what was the problem she said I don't have enough he won't share enough and when he outlined what he gave her he said well I gave her a a Jaguar and she didn't like it. I bought her a Seville and she didn't like that. I bought her a Mercedes and she didn't like that. I give her an allowance. I think way back then it was something like two thousand dollars a week. And you know what my brain was saying while well, I said, you mean he doesn't give you enough money? If he gave it to me, I could be happy and my wife could be happy. We could both be happy. <laughs> what I discovered was that it's not money that makes you happy. It's way more than that. What do you say? First uh, Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. Uh, ladies, you ought to turn over here because this is going to talk about what a man ought to do. And I know you want to take this somewhere and hang it on the wall, but you better be careful because I got one for you. First Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. Short little text. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, I don't know how it came to be that way, but the things that say what men ought to do tend to be kind of narrow and the ones that say what women ought to do kind of get broad some people say it's because of the time when the bible was written i don't know let's let's just see what the bible says this is first timothy chapter 5 verse 8 but if any provide not for his own and especially for those of his own house he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel is that strong enough? So I guess what I want to say to brethren is before you say I do, make sure you can. <laughs> hmm? 
Hmm? I, I am still shocked at the people who get ready to get married and if they come to me for counsel, one of the sections of my counsel is, let's talk about your budget. And they say, uh, what, budget? <laughs> yeah, budget. Uh, where's your income going to come from? And I, I am shocked sometimes to discover that maybe nobody works. Well, I, I got to leave that alone because I'll spend too much time on it. What do they think is going to happen? You know, being alone with no income is bad enough. You're going to join with somebody else in this situation? So what are you going to do? I, I know what they believe. They believe that love conquers all. And that may be true, but it will have a struggle with hunger pains. Uh, look at uh, Proverbs, ladies, before you get too excited. Proverbs. Actually, there's a whole chapter in Proverbs that you ought to read, but I won't go through it because it would seem uneven. So I'm only going to read one verse from Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 30. Uh, <laughs> here is the conclusion. Ladies, if you really want to check, because the reason why you ought to check is because your husband is going to go read this. So you maybe want to know what he read. He will read Proverbs chapter 31. You might want to read it. I'm only going to give you the conclusive end. And here's what it says in verse 30. Well, let me read verse 30 and 31. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. If you go back through this chapter, you will discover the traditional marriage described. Today we know that there are marriages that are non-traditional or contemporary. There are marriages where the man is not the only breadwinner. In fact, some would say that you can't make it without having both of the spouses being breadwinners. When the wife goes to work, you are no longer in a traditional marriage. Now there are men who believe that even after she goes to work, the rules still apply. I wish you'd go in there and, and cook something. <laughs> Somebody needs to vacuum. Somebody ought to do the laundry. Well, if you are working and she's working, the somebody may be you. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. My wife had a job. Well, she's had a few jobs where she made way more money than I did. You should have seen me. When she brought that big old check home, I put a smile on her face. I didn't even know. <laughs> Every now and then, I'd even go in the kitchen, get me a bunch of timers and a bunch of recipes, and at least let her know I was trying to cook something. Come on in, girl. And <laughs> she might have had to put something in it to make it right. But what I wanted to let her know is, honey, when you plank that big check down and it goes boom, I'm a man working to make it good for you. <laughs> so, here's what you got to do. You got to decide, do you have a traditional marriage or a non-traditional marriage? If it's traditional and she stays home, then you got a right to go on in there and, you know, um, uh, you know. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you're paying the bills, if you are the only breadwinner, then you will find in this chapter where it says, sister, don't be home, you know, dialing up them shows. <laughs> Man, leave home, you got rollers. Do they still wear rollers? <laughs> I think they do. I saw a lady the other day. And then when he comes back, you haven't moved. Nothing in the house has moved. You know, go on in there. I think there's something left over. Nah, that's not the deal. But if both of you are working, then you've got to share the responsibilities. Does that sound okay to you? Uh, look at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 
I want to talk about some of the practical things that can happen in a marriage to make it better. First Peter chapter 3 and we're going to start with verse 8. This is a text that most people would not apply to marriage, but uh, I'm going to do it because it fits. First Peter chapter 3 starting with verse 8. Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, that doesn't mean you're not married, but love as brethren, be pitiful and courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that you are thereunto called that you should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. What you need to know is that when you shut the doors of your house, God is still looking. There are people who have split personalities in their marriages. When they're out there, oh honey, how are you? Come, come dear. This is my wife. Yes, honey. They say, oh look, this is my, you know. And then when they get inside, uh, see you tomorrow. Take out the trash. Did you pay the bill? You turn into maintenance conversation. But what you need to know is that fake you putting on outside, you need to be better inside the house when nobody's looking than when somebody is looking because the eyes of God are on you. So you gotta, you gotta pay attention to that. Uh, you ought to, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26, the Bible says that you ought to end each day without the sun going down on your wrath. I'm gonna get to some wonderful things that will kind of connect with this. But if you want to stay married a long time, don't let stuff build up. Huh? Handle it while it's small. There are no two people who fit perfectly. Somebody in your family had a habit that you thought was okay. But when you get in a household with somebody else, I don't care if you were reared next door to each other, there are things that your family did and things that your family did that don't match. So you may be sitting there and you know, it gets a little quiet when you first get to the real marriage. I'm not talking about that. <sighs> you know, everybody can deal with that. That's what you saw on television. <sighs> and then it kind of gets to, hey, how you doing? And then you, and you know, he's trying to figure out how could he miss that when y'all were dating each other? Did you, did you always make that sound? She said, well, you got a lot of nerve to talk. You, you drop clothes all through the house every day when you come home. And if you keep on letting little stuff go by like that, you got to handle it proactively. But the Bible says, no matter what goes on, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. In fact, Proverbs 15 and verse 1 says that a soft answer turneth away wrath. I'm getting ready to give you a rule that is not in the Bible, but I can almost qualify it as an experience to power moment. Think before you speak. Tell you something about words. You believe that little stuff you heard when you were a kid, sticks and stones on. may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. The reason why you need to think, in fact, sometimes you need to just shut up, pray. Because once words get out there, you can't pull them back. And you want your spouse to forgive and forget but you'll be surprised, nine years later, you'll be in an argument. I remember what you said. <laughs> so try to let as few negative words get out there as possible. Guard your tongue. That's some good advice, trust me. Uh, then 
let, let me run down a few things. You ought to inspire each other to achieve. Let me tell you something. Anything that a spouse becomes is affected by their partner. Huh? You get the wrong partner, and you know, you come in with the idea, hey, I'm, you know something, I'm, I'm going to go and I'm going to take some courses, and because uh, I'm thinking, I got a, you know, I got a little skill, and yeah, what you ought to do is stay on that job you got. Yeah. You're, you're, you know, I don't know about all your old dreams. I know you're getting a check. <laughs> so you know what you just did? You just killed a dream. Why don't you sit down with them and say, yeah, let me tell you something. You see that little lady I'm married to, that, that's a powerful little woman. There are times when, when I think I can't do stuff. And she'll start talking her stuff. I, I start feeling myself grow. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, I got an idea. She said, yeah, do that. But, you know, she may ask me now, how you going to finance it? That's okay. <laughs> but you, you've got to inspire the best in each other. And, and, and unless you find out that somebody does inspire the best in you don't marry them by the time they get through pushing you down and down and down and there's some people who get excited about pushing you down you cannot have that kind of experience in you you ought to inspire each other to do a bit more things you ought to share interests marriage is like a ladder the two vertical pieces must have connecting rungs if you have nothing in common, I almost said, if you have nothing in common but sensuality, but if you have nothing in common, there will come a time when, you, when you're trying to figure out what should we do now. But you ought to have some things that are in common. You ought to learn to like the things that interest your spouse. When my wife and I got married, I could care less about furniture. The family where I grew up, we did not have discretionary income to worry about styles of furniture. We thought a chair was still a chair. <laughs> but my wife had studied these things, and so I must tell you that at first it was a little awkward, but I said, yeah, yeah, man, what kind of chair is that? Yeah, that's that's uh, Mediterranean. <laughs> ah. All right, I can see that. <laughs> uh, I, I always like to look at cars, even when I couldn't buy them, so she'd go out and look for cars. I, she didn't particularly like cars, but she, you know, yeah, you've got to share things. And the more things you share, the tighter your two vertical pieces become, and it welds you together. Huh? If all the things you like are with the girls, or if all your things that you like are with the boys, you're going to grow closer to the girls and the boys than to each other, and trouble will follow. I should have charged tonight. I knew it. <laughs> Remember special days. Gentlemen, let's be real. There are some days you ought to put in your Palm Pilot uh, your organizer, your Rolodex, write them on a piece of paper and stick them in your closet. But there are days you can't let pass. All right? You let an anniversary go by. She won't come straight at you. I guess today is just a regular day, huh? If you got a bad memory, write them down. Put them in a book you always look in. And ladies, you ought not make it a one-way affair. The man in your life deserves to have special days recognized too. <laughs> in fact, you ought to make every day special. Uh, the things you used to do 
when you were trying to win each other and impress each other. Come on now, I'm not going to bother with you long. I don't have time. But you remember. Uh, don't, wait a minute, honey. You in. Move up just a little bit. You remember that? Uh, now, hey, what you waiting for? And, and sister, come on now, talk to me about that meal. Even when you had to go to your mom's place to get her to cook the thing, when you brought it home, it was yours. And you had a little candlelight, you know, and all kinds of stuff, and you had a little, you know. You, you, you got to keep on doing that. If you know the man likes a special kind of something, cook it again. Huh? And, and kind of kind of look like you used to look when you cooked it. <laughs> because if you make every day special, the, the life you live together will be a joy. Let, let me tell you what I need to share with you. There's a gentleman in Africa who's like a brother to me. I heard him express something and I borrowed it and I asked him, could I? And he said, yes. We are teaching, all of us married folk, are teaching a generation of children something that is a lie. Let me demonstrate it. You are in your car in traffic, the red light comes on and you're behind a car where a man and a woman are so close together that you can barely tell who's driving. Are they married or single? You can't make up your mind? You're behind a car and the man is on this door. <laughs> and the woman is on this door. Married or single? <laughs> let, let me tell you what we're teaching children. Stick with me. This is serious. We are teaching young people that you can only be happy when you sneak. We're teaching them that the joy goes out when the marriage starts. There are even religious couples who don't drive to church together. You know, well, no, you go and then I'll go. So you never see them in the same space. But your kids know that everything on television, everything in motion pictures, where somebody is, hey, how you doing? I'm so glad. Give me a call. I love you so much. Everybody doing that is single. Everybody doing that is doing something that's not according to the word of God. Then they come home and there you are. You know. You, hey, how you doing? You are. Right. How your day go? Okay. I'm going to watch TV. Okay. I'm going to go on because I got to call some of my friends. And they find out that when you're married, you come apart. We are guilty of giving them a false impression because the fact is that God's blessing is on a marriage. I'm coming to it. It's, it's my best part. So I'm suggesting to you that you must learn to act as though you're still in love. Huh? Because you know you love each other. If anybody stop you and say, uh, Oh, sir, you like, oh yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm in love. <laughs> Do you love him? Oh, yeah, sure. But that's not the way you used to say it. You remember where you, where you used to say it? You know, oh yeah. <laughs> Whoo, <love. laughs> And you know, you all us smiles. Do I love that man? Look at him. <laughs> But when, when you get married, that drains away. It's, it's not right. We are teaching young. And then when your, when your daughter and your son go get involved in something they shouldn't be, you say, why did you do that? And they can't tell you the truth. They could say, because it don't look like to me that you and daddy got anything left. And it looked like the folks out there are enjoying love. And I'm telling you something. Married people have got to stop acting like they are brother and sister. All right, I got too close to you. You got quiet. 
I got one last thing to say before I go into some serious stuff. Don't tell your business. If your man is not pleasing you right now, see, because he did, or else you wouldn't be married to him. But if you come to a rough place in the road and every couple will find some place that's rough. Don't go out, you know, I'm having a hard time. My man is, let me tell you something. That person you're telling about your man may be quite encouraged to hear what you're saying. <laughs> Are you still listening to him? Yes. That, that, that woman at the office that you're telling, I don't know, I, we got some problems in our marriage. We, we don't seem to understand each other. That woman, that woman that you're telling, the, you can't tell other people because they may look at your mate. You can't share things with a man and think that he won't think thoughts about moving in. Keep your business to yourself. Sister, if you tell another sister, she may be looking at him. If you tell a man, he may be looking at you. Brother, if you tell another man, he may be looking at your wife. And these days, I need to take you to Malachi. It's amazing what you get on your own. Malachi, chapter 2. Are you with me? Last book in the Old Testament. And I've got to read you something that I used to put at the very end, but it needs to be in the middle, and that's where we'll put it tonight. This is Malachi, chapter 2. And go to verse 16. Malachi, chapter 2, verse 16. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith, that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. This text is pretty clear. You don't need a background in theology or biblical languages. What it says is that God hates divorce. God hates it. He says it's covering violence with your garment. In other words, it's doing violence, but then covering it up. It, the, the background of this text had to do with priests who had married young and then dealt treacherously, according to the words here, with the young women that they married and had moved on. Let me tell you something. When the Bible says that you get married, God makes you one flesh, Take that seriously. When you get divorced, it is equal to an amputation. I know, not because I've been through it, praise God, but I've met people who were strongly constituted, but they got married and they thought that divorce was a minor thing. But God says, I will make twain one flesh. And when God performs that miracle, and he does, and then you say, well, let's break up. It's not as easy to break up after God has made you one flesh. And even, even under the best of legal circumstances, divorce is a horrible situation. It will cause much pain. It not only causes pain for those who divorce, but for children who are innocent and have to suffer because of it. In fact, in Malachi, it part me, in Matthew, uh, there's only re one reason in the Bible for divorce. It is not irreconcilable differences. All of us know that broad term in America. It means you can put anything together if you've got the right lawyer. But, you know, well, I wasn't thrilled anymore. There's nowhere in the marriage vow that it says, I will thrill my partner from this day forward. I, we talked about that already. But the fact is, that, that this divorce thing has gotten so broad that people divorce for reasons that don't make sense. When you get into a marriage, you've got to understand that you're there for the long term and it may not be always, every day won't be scintillating. Every day you won't be floating on air, but you've got to come together in the spirit of Christ. And if Jesus is between you, he will pull you back together. For what he accomplishes, he can heal. 
So if he put you together, he can bring you back. If you understand it, can I hear you say amen? amen. This is Matthew chapter 5, and let's look at verse 31. I think we need 31 and 32. And here's what it says. It has been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. God says, if you don't have an unfaithfulness issue, not clothes around the house, not habits that I couldn't understand, but unfaithfulness to the marriage vow and the fact is that unless there is abuse of some kind genuine physical or psychological abuse there are other ways to handle those problems and I suggest in fact let's let's go to this text Matthew chapter 18 because I think some people ought to consider it even if you have the grounds for divorce do I have your attention Matthew chapter 18, even if you have the grounds for divorce, the fact is, let me go with verse 21, that you've got to consider this. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. I want to be clear. You must exclude abusive situations from this but if your mate has done something that has hurt you and that can happen if that person is willing to confess what they have done and face up to what they've done and ask the Lord to forgive them for what they've done and ask you to forgive them for what they've done you may do better forgiving the one you know than trying someone you don't know. I have seen marriages that were stronger after a rift than they were before. So I'm saying to you that God hates divorce. If you are thinking about it tonight, try everything before you do it because God hates it. That is the word of God. Forgiveness is sometimes the better thing. Now. I'm, I'm coming to some amazing stuff. Go to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. I would, I would wager that somebody has not looked at this particular text in this particular way. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. If God is love, then I believe he is. If God is love, I, I believe there's no question. First John chapter, chapter 4 verse 16 says, love is of God. If love cannot exist outside of God, then without God in your marriage, you can't fake love. You can't mimic love. You can't experiment with love. You can't even make love. Because without God, there can be no love. So if you don't have God in your relationship now, invite him in. Because whatever you had before God got there may have been something wonderful, but it wasn't love. Because God is love. I, I dare you to get closer to God. I dare you because if you get closer to God, God has promised that he will do things for people who love him. Everything that God touches gets better. I'm going to stop a minute and just try to let you understand what I'm trying to preach. If God touches it, it improves. So, so without God, there can be no real love. The Bible says that marriage should be the, the uh, formula for handling loneliness. Uh, in fact, let's go there. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. Start at the beginning. We can get this in quickly. I can't read all of these, but some of them need to be read. 
uh, Genesis chapter 2. And uh, let's start with verse 22. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let the fowl multiply. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman, brought her to the man. Told you about that last night. But God did not take a rib with plans for taking more ribs. Oh say, can you see? See, if God had left that, that thing open, say, look, Adam, we're going to try this. I may have to go back in. <laughs> there was only one rib. So, so the connection was not temporary. There are people who actually marry. I talked to a couple for just a little while. I, I brought them together for counsel, and they said, Pastor, we're going to get married, but we're, gonna, we, we're just going to try it out. I said, I'm sorry, I'm finished. <laughs> you got to find another counselor. Because I don't counsel temporary arrangements. I don't have time in my life to counsel folk who who trying it out. Marriage does not have a trial. You ought to know something before you get into it. Because God did not intend that marriage be impermanent. So there's no question but that God intended for it to last forever. There are ways that he intended to make it so it would last and among the wonderful things and i i must tell you that i i believe that god invented sex in fact i'm about to prove some things from the word of god but that was not the stabilizing force god invented the connection that he makes between a man and a woman he says the twain shall become one flesh. In Ephesians, he says, I compare marriage to my relationship with my people. And I got a question that's easy to answer. Is Jesus going to leave you? Under no circumstances is Jesus going to leave. You may leave. In fact, I say to you tonight, anybody who ever says that we are not together anymore, you can't see, say Jesus left because he never does. He's always there. In, in Hebrews chapter 13, I can't go to it, verses, verse 4, it says marriage is honorable and the bed is undefiled. Some people are shocked at that. What God intends to say is that marriage brings honor and in a marriage relationship, God blesses the physical connection. It's one of the things that he put there to keep us together. In fact, 1 Corinthians, you ought to read this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and if you go to verses 4 and 5, 1 Corinthians 7, verses 4 and 5, you discover that there are rules there. It says, the wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also, the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one another, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves unto fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Now this is, this, this is pretty clear. God says when you get married, you don't have control over your own body anymore. You just gave your body, my brother, to your wife. Chrysostom says, that under the circumstance that a woman of low morality should approach you with temptation and should offer you some dalliance, you must say to her, I cannot because my body does not belong to me but to my wife. Yeah. Huh? Is that clear enough or do we need to put some more edge on it? Sister, I don't care who he is. These days, people are looking at pictures everywhere that incline us to want to find something better. Let me tell you something about the beauty of being married for a long time. And I want to recommend this to you. If you want to get your wife excited and, and make her remember things that she hasn't in a long time, describe what she looked like when you first saw her. 
Because see, all them little bodies running around on television, they may be full of saline and silicone. <laughs> but you know what your wife is made of. You sit down with her. In fact, tonight wouldn't be a bad night. Sit down and say, girl, when I met you, woo. First thing, you know, tell her some other. Don't get all excited for her. Don't move to the central movement. So your eyes were so beautiful. And then there was your character. Because I'm going to tell you something. Character is more important than shape. Form and shape may disappear, but character will last. Tell about it. And, and look, you know the beautiful thing? As you grow older together, you change. You go through stages together. So I can tell my baby what she looked like when I first met her. I said, girl, you're a little thin, you know, but you, everything was right where it was supposed to be. And when I first saw you, I knew I had a little thing. And, and I tried to run because I didn't want to get serious, but I kept on coming back because not only were you beautiful outside, but you were beautiful inside. And then when we got married and you started changing, when you, when you had our babies, I loved you for having our babies. And I did, I used to get excited. I, I, I loved the way she looked. I loved when that little belly developed and you know, a couple of changes in that nose and I loved the nose. <laughs> but when I described to her what she has been over the years, things get exciting. She does it to me too, you know, because I wasn't always like this. <laughs> I used to look okay. <laughs> Time has been unkind, but she reminds me. She said, when I first saw you, you know, she'll explain, she'll talk about what it, what, what it was that excited her. And you know something? When she described me, I kind of straighten up. <laughs> Well, <laughs> you're a slow audience if you don't have it by now. Let me take you to my main text. Are you ready to go there? Uh, go to Proverbs chapter 5. And uh, the clock is angry, but it cannot steal this from us because this is the experience, the power moment for tonight. And I think you're going to like it. Proverbs chapter 5. And let's start with Verse 15, drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of waters in the streets. Let them only, let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. God intended husbands and wives to rejoice together. Amen. If you're walking around looking mad, you don't touch each other's hands anymore. You don't go anywhere with each other anymore. You don't find each other's company enticing. You have done something wrong. Here is what God says. In, in the days of old, you connected wells and cisterns Got to make sure I get it right. You, consist, you connected wells and cisterns with home. But fountains and rivers were in the street. What this text actually says, are your waters scattered in the street? Are you drinking water that runs in the street? Why would you drink water and not know what's in it. Trying my best to preach. Why would you drink polluted water? Why would you go in the street in some river that's flowing in a dirty street or some fountain that's public where everybody's been drinking? Who knows who drank their last? Huh? I'm trying to preach. I don't know whether y'all got it, but I'm preaching it. When you come home, you got a well. It's covered. You can let down your bucket in your own well. 
pour it into your own cistern so you know where it came from, you know what's in it, you have tasted it before, you know it's not going to hurt you, it's only going to do you good. So while other folks are thirsty, you know, it's amazing, single people you know, before they get married, I, I don't even want to get married. I, I don't, you know, I, I'm not even interested. Yeah, but you're thirsty. <laughs> thirsty. In fact, sometimes your thirst drives you to do things that you never ought to have done. But here's what God says in Proverbs. He says, sister, you don't have to be thirsty anymore. I'm giving you your own well. And I'm giving you your own container, your sister. So your days of drinking in the street are over. You don't have to worry about being thirsty. All you need to do is get home. <laughs> so if you're thirsty, just hold on. Y'all ain't trying to hear me, I'm making a, an amazing parallel here. If you get thirsty in the street, don't let anybody offer you strange water. Because God is looking at your thirst and how you quench it. So sister, if God has given you a man, he may not look like he used to look. His hair may be gone, his hair may be gray, he may be bent over, but he's your well. And he got bent over by going out working to make your house a home. He got that way by bringing home what you needed to rear your children. And you ought to hold on to that man, rub his bald head and praise God for it. If that woman isn't exactly like she used to be, if she doesn't look quite in the same shape, remember that she got that way by bearing your children, by making your house a home. She got that way by taking care of you. She gave herself. She may have gone to work to make your house successful. So if she's a little bit less lovely than Madison Avenue thinks, you know who she is. And I'm telling you, when you get thirsty in the street, don't drink what's out there. Get home before you quench your thirst. Until Friday night, may God hear you when you call. May God lift you if you fall. May God bless you as you stand. May God hold you in the palm of his hand. Good night. God bless you. Walter Pearson believes that Jesus Christ is the answer to every problem you face.